Hello, welcome to Europe Now. I'm Catherine Nicholson and we are in Central Europe in the shadow of the war in Ukraine, launched by Russian President Vladimir Putin on February 24th. Since that day, millions of Ukrainians have fled the bloodshed in their homeland, most of them passing through the four European Union countries that share a land border with Ukraine. Well, in our programme, we are bringing you to two of them, Poland, where we are now, and Hungary, where we'll travel a little bit later on in the show. Now, both of these countries have taken in large numbers of Ukrainian refugees, and both agreed to the initial European Union sanctions packages against Russia. Since then, however, differences have emerged between these two traditional ally governments. And in this programme, we'll be looking into how and why that's come about. We'll also be exploring some other areas that concern both countries, such as the ever-expanding EU files on degradations of rule of law in Poland and Hungary. Well, we'll start our programme here next to Warsaw's Western Railway Station on this side and behind me, the bus station, a place where many of the Ukrainian refugees have arrived in Poland's capital in recent months. It's also a place where some of them are starting to return to Ukraine, principally the parts of the west of the country where Russian troops have withdrawn. The majority, though, of Ukrainian refugees remaining here in Poland, looking for housing, for work, as Magdalena Chodovnik reports. The war in Ukraine has had a profound effect on Warsaw. Since February, 3.5 million refugees have flooded over the border into Poland. At its peak, the population of the Polish capital increased by 17 per cent. Most of the arrivals are women and children, and many have left behind their husbands and fathers to fight the war. That's the case for Natalia and her son. They started bombing our city from the very beginning of the war on February 24th. When I opened my eyes, my husband was standing by the window. Then I felt an explosion. It was before six in the morning. I was very scared. It took us five days to get to the border. Then we went to get a Polish identification number. We got a work permit. We got the documents for the school. We received training for two weeks. And after that, this restaurant was already about to open. The children will go to school and I will go to work so I don't stay at home and think of this war all the time. They were very welcoming at school. I go to class, my work is graded, and now I have learned to say a few things in Polish. With new homes, new jobs and new schools, as the weeks turn into months, the initial humanitarian aid has changed, with the focus now on providing the foundations for the newcomers to build new lives. This is a unique migration situation because they're mainly women with children who are arriving. And it's also unique because nearly 40% of the people of working age have found jobs already. A joint government and employer portal will also be launched, which will also facilitate contact between the employee and the employer. The solidarity has become a source of pride across the political spectrum. But for opposition parties like the left, there is still room for improvement, both at the national and international levels. I would appeal to the governments to make sure that they keep providing aid to families who help Ukrainians. Many of them are people who already have families to support, and they're busy helping. But there are no places in nurseries for their children, for example. We should also invest a lot of time and resources in psychological help and psychiatric help for people fleeing from Ukraine, so that Ukrainians who return there are stronger. Indeed, many refugees already face a choice to stay in Poland and build new lives or return home, even as the war continues to rage in Ukraine. I'm Marcin Przydacz, Deputy Foreign Minister of Poland. It is 
kind of uh, moral obligation to help people. For us, for Poles, Ukrainians are uh, neighbors. Uh, this is a country at war, so it was natural for us to help them. So far, more than three million people crossed the Polish uh, border. Um, uh, more than 2.5 uh, of those stayed in Poland. They're our guests. They can stay as long as it's needed uh, for them to survive. And do you feel that the integration of these refugees is going well? It is a lot of people to take in in a short amount of time. Well, it is going well. Even before the war, there were already two million Ukrainian people living in, in Poland. We are, in terms of culture and language, quite, uh, quite similar. So it's much easier for Ukrainians to integrate within the Polish um, society. It has been noted that Poland took a very different stance with refugees fleeing other wars, Syria, for example. Uh, this experience with Ukraine has shown that Poland can take in asylum seekers. During the migration crisis in 2015, the, um, the case was that those people didn't want to come to Poland. The, it was rather the European Union which was trying to force them to come to Poland or to live uh, in our territory. We well, are the people free of free. We are the country of free people. Whoever wants to come uh, is very much welcome as a refugee. Mm -hmm. But we are we, we are not going to force anybody to live in our country. Under international law, people who are fleeing wars are entitled to protection in in a safe country. In 2015, the vast majority of those who were fleeing Syria or who were like just escaping from Africa, Poland was not the preferable um, destination for them, which is not the case in, with Ukrainian. On the issue of sanctions against Russia, Poland has enthusiastically joined with the EU measures so far. Uh, in contrast, though, uh, another Ukrainian neighbour, Hungary, opposed sending weapons, opposed the oil embargo. Uh, Budapest has long been an ally of Warsaw, of your government. Does Poland have a message for Prime Minister Viktor Orban? Diplomacy can work and we are doing um, our best together with our, with our European friends in order to convince uh, um, Hungary when it comes to the relations with the Commission, with the European European Union, when the Commission was trying somehow to push us, both of our countries, it was quite natural to have a, a tactical um, alliance. Poland's government, Hungary's government, both still under scrutiny over rule of law, degradation concerns, uh, facing sanctions at the EU level. Is that alliance with Hungary still strong then? When we joined in 2004 EU, we believed that it's a sphere of freedom where people are I mean, doing much better than out of this organization. Let's not give any opportunity to those who want to spoil this project by domination. So is your government going to address any of the concerns raised in the EU's rule of law? No, we, of course we do. I mean, we are in a permanent contact with the, with the Commission. Of course, the system in Poland is not perfect. It's not also perfect in many other countries, but we should care about our, our own um, homeland. Minister Pshidaj, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. I'm Radek Sikorski, member of the European Parliament from the European People's Party and former Foreign and Defence Minister of Poland. The opposition and the government basically have the same attitude that we should be helping Ukraine. Solidarity is a word that is highly, highly valued in Poland and there is a genuine feeling of brotherhood with, uh, with Ukraine. And you yourself have had Ukrainian refugees in your home? Ten initially. They've now gone on uh, to Germany. Uh, I have another group of uh, a family of three. The Polish government has pushed very hard for more tougher sanctions on Russia. Some other states resisting that. Is the Polish government taking the right stance? Uh, yes, I think it is, because we need to uh, deprive uh, Putin of the money to continue with this war. And we should make ourselves less dependent. One EU state, uh, very different to Poland in this response, Hungary, it's resisted the oil embargo particularly. All the same though, uh, we've spoken to the Deputy Foreign Minister, Mr. Pshidaj. Uh, he told us that despite the differences over the sanctions, Poland's government is still keen to generally support the government of Viktor Orban, particularly in disputes with the European Union. Poland could now be resolving its problems with EU institutions and returning to the decision-making circle. And instead, uh, there is still this, uh, this ideological alliance with anti-Europeans, such as Orban and 
and uh, Mrs. Le Pen. Hungary and Poland are still under pressure from European institutions over rule of law degradations. Uh, when I spoke to Deputy Foreign Minister Pshidech about this, he told us it was unfair and being led by uh, left liberal politicians in the EU. I'm afraid Poland has slipped in many indices of uh, democracy, of freedom of the media, of perception of corruption and so on. You know, can all these institutions be wrong and only Mr. Przydać being right? I don't think so. You know, it's not just the European Commission, it's, it's the Venice Commission, it, it's the European Court of Justice, it's the European Court of Human Rights, it's the European Parliament. One person tells you you're drunk, maybe they are wrong, but if it's two or three, you should go and have a nap. <laughs> the declared policy of the current populist Polish government is to help Ukraine become a candidate country of the EU. Well, if we want any other post-communist country ever to join, then we can't escalate our rule of law problems and our conflicts with the EU and its member states, because that clearly makes them uh, more wary of admitting new members from the, post, from the former uh, communist bloc, uh, because the thinking is, well, if there are rule of law problems in Hungary and Poland, then there will be even more problems with those other countries. Uh, so, so this policy is inconsistent. Yes, Radek Sikorski, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Well, time now for us to leave the Polish capital behind and take you to the southern city of Krakow. My name is Róża Thun. I'm a member of the European Parliament from Poland in the Renew Group and I'm happy to see you in my hometown, Krakow. Thanks for oh, meeting hello, us. Hello, how nice hey to there. see you. Let's go in. Please, Thank you. please, I will show you around. Roja Thun has brought us to this Centre for Ukrainian Refugees. It's run by the Volnanam Charity Foundation. Its president, Agata, is going to share us around. The residents, uh, we have about 120. So now we are in our uh, biggest dormitory. You know, it's, it's really uncomfortable, but there is our condition. Uh, and I want to show you the smallest room. This is the room of the, uh, our family from Kharkov. This is uh, mom, Oksana, with three uh, boys and they decided to stay here because they don't have any perspective for going so, uh, somewhere else. In the first of the March, it was empty building without anything, without furniture, without showers, without uh, uh, bathrooms, without anything. So it was just abundant and empty. We have uh, private donors. It's huge companies, but it's, uh, it's uh, small companies too. It uh, are some kind of associations. They give us uh, money for innovation. And we are still don't have any money from the uh, municipality or from the government. As soon as the Russian soldiers are gone, those women with children want to go back, join their families, their husbands who are there in war, rebuild their houses. Um, I myself host six persons and they want, from eastern Ukraine, and they want to go back. Hundreds of Ukrainian women have reported being raped by Russian soldiers. Here in Poland, there are some of the toughest abortion laws in Europe, if not in the world. If a Ukrainian rape victim arrives here in Poland, can she access abortion? As far as I know, women must prove that they were raped in this case. I don't know how it's possible altogether. What I know is that this extremely restrictive rule forces those women um, to either go in the underground, have an illegal abortion, or go abroad. Mm. But it doesn't diminish the number of abortions, as far as I know, at all. Do you think this situation could change Polish uh, opinion or law on abortions? Polish opinion on abortion is completely different than what the government decided 
or the, the, the party that has a majority in the parliament. Uh, Poland is a country that is becoming more and more liberal as far as public opinion is concerned. What I would expect from this government is to give support to women in an extremely difficult and dramatic situation and not impose restrictions on them. It doesn't help. Now, outside of Poland, there's been a lot of praise for this country's reaction and response to the war and the refugees. At the same time, the European Commission is withholding almost 60 billion euros of COVID recovery money. Uh, this, over a separate issue, rule of law degradation allegations. Do you think that there should be a change in stance from the European Commission in light of Poland's uh, response to the war? European Commission cannot allow breaches of law. That's why it exists. This is the first duty of European Commission is to watch over the respect of, for law. This is the obligation of the Polish government to follow the laws, not to dismantle the democracy. Looking at recent polling, the current governing party, Law and Justice, does still seem to have the single biggest share of the vote. Uh, a lot of Polish people seem to agree with this party and their positions. The governmental party is the strongest in uh, Poland, but if you take the sum of the opposition party, the support for them, um, I think that we have a big chance to win the elections uh, spring of next year. And you believe that Poland does still have a future in the European Union? I don't see any other future than Poland within the European Union. Poland must re remain and wants to remain in the European Union. The Polish society is very pro-European. 80% of Poles say yes to the European Union. So um, uh, I believe that we will come back again on the path of the rule of law, of solidarity with the European Union, that we will reinforce it and be reinforced by it. Rosatin, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, it's time for us to leave Poland now and head a bit further south down to Hungary. That's where I hope to see you in part two of Europe Now. Welcome back to Europe Now. If you missed part one of the programme in Poland, you can find it on our website, france24.com. Now, some of you might recognise from the building behind me that we are still in Central Europe. We are in Hungary, in fact, another one of Ukraine's EU land border neighbours. Well, similarly to Poland, Hungary has taken in large numbers of Ukrainian refugees. However, the government here has refused to let military aid cross its territory or to give weapons to Ukraine itself. It's also been reluctant to join in on certain EU sanctions packages, notably an oil embargo on Russia. Well, we'll be looking into these and other issues in this part of our programme. Well, first, uh, the 2022 parliamentary election was supposed to be a major test for Viktor Orban, the first since he came to office just over a decade ago. For the first time in their history, Hungary's opposition joined together to present one unified candidate against him, Peter Markizoy. However, instead of this weakening Orban's position, he actually emerged with a two-thirds supermajority in this parliament behind me. Our reporter Luke Brown looks into why, once again, Victor was victorious. This housing estate is so new it's still covered in building materials. But it's also a new home for Istvan, his wife and three children, largely thanks to government aid for large families. It's thanks to my kids and to the support of the state. It was a big advantage for us that the government supports families with three kids. It wasn't like that before. The government provided a 25,000 euro grant as well as paying half the price of this new seven-seater family car. That state generosity has helped cement Fidesz's popularity. 
The election result marked a sharp divide, with the capital Budapest voting against Orban, while rural regions and small towns supported the Prime Minister. I do believe that Fidesz won these elections thanks to the aid it has provided to the families, especially in rural areas like here. In the months preceding the election, the Hungarian government wooed voters with 5 billion euros of tax cuts and pay rises. For the opposition candidate Peter Markizoy, that contributed to an almost unwinnable situation. The opposition had more resources, uh, better preparedness than ever before, and we failed miserably. We just cannot defeat Fidesz. We thought that there is an exit. We understood that the, the election will not be a democratic election. It will not be free and fair. But we were still hoping the miracle will happen uh, on April 3rd, but it didn't. As a conservative anti-corruption figure, Marki Zoy had hoped to appeal to disaffected Fidesz voters. But with only five minutes of campaign airtime on the public broadcasters, he says it was almost impossible to reach the electors. As long as Viktor Orban can rule communication in this country, they can brainwash Hungarian people into even fighting uh, Brussels, the European Union. They built up the anti-war hysteria in three weeks. He managed to paint himself as the only uh, guarantee for peace and uh, security in Hungary, and if the opposition wins, everybody will have to go to Ukraine to die. Independent OSC observers said the elections did not provide a level playing field, notably criticizing unfair campaign finances. Orban, thanks to his two-thirds supermajority in Parliament since 2010, has been able to change the constitution at will. On paper, all uh, the playing level field is, is equal. But what's happening before a 50-day long campaign period, there are no rules at all. This is something that uh, can be used by the opposition parties and the government parties as well, but the governing parties have a thousand times more sources to use this uh, unexisting rules. But Fidesz's dominance leaves little room for the democratic opposition. Anita Putz is a small-town mayor who backed Peter Markizoy. Since then, she's faced threats from Fidesz activists, and now her council has called a snap election two years ahead of schedule. She says she's being punished for not showing enough loyalty to the governing party. Fidesz has built a feudal system here. Fidesz ensures that everyone, local budgets, public employees, depends on the party. It's a feudal system that's being built in the 21st century. Other mayors say they've lost funding due to their support of the opposition. Claims refuted by the ruling Fidesz party. My name is Balázs Hidvégi, I'm a Hungarian member of the European Parliament for the governing Fidesz party. I've been a member of the EP since 2019. Previously, I was a spokesman for my party. Hungary that has got uh, stronger in terms of economic output, that has got uh, more stable. After the COVID uh, uh, pandemic and now the war uh, just uh, uh, next to our country, um, I think uh, Viktor Orban guaranteed stability and peace to Hungarians, and that was decisive uh, in the decision. There's been a report by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, as you know, a non-political organization that Hungary is a member of. Uh, this report criticized the lack of a level playing field in the election campaign, for example. Uh, the opposition leader, Mr. Markizoy, got just five minutes of airtime on TV. Well, that's uh, just not um, uh, uh, true, actually. Approximately one third of the time in the news program is devoted to the governing party. Well, another third is uh, devoted to the opposition and their views. Uh, and the third is devoted to the government decisions. That's just a very transparent and good system. Let's look at the war in Ukraine. Hungary has taken in a large proportion of Ukrainian refugees comparable to its own population. Important to your government to show this solidarity. It's just a human thing to do, uh, no question about it. Ukraine and Ukrainians are in trouble. They've been attacked. The most evident thing that we have everybody who asks for help. In earlier situations where there were asylum seekers, the Hungarian government didn't want to take them in. What's the difference between a 
asylum seeker from Ukraine and an asylum seeker from Syria, for example? We have always given asylum to everyone who uh, asked for it and who had the right to receive it in Hungary. Uh, where what we said no to was uh, illegal economic migration. Of course, there are economic migrants, there are asylum seekers. However, how can Hungary know what that person's situ situation is before they've made their application? Uh, it's the first, first secure country where uh, refugee state or, or asylum needs to be requested. So if but somebody if already asks left for... Greece, they've gone through the Balkans, they've arrived in Hungary, they haven't put in an application request. If they've gone through the request. Balkans, they've already been to a secure country. Yes, but they haven't put in an application request. But they should have, and the country where they, they, where they entered should have registered them. Let's look right now at uh, one particular issue where for quite a long time the Hungarian government has been clashing with the European Commission regarding rule of law. This report from Luke Brown. Hungarian MP Akos Hadhazi is a man on a crusade against corruption. He's been contacted by Norbert, who says he's been cheated out of EU funds meant to renovate his family home. The village council put the EU panel on the wall, but they've done nothing. All they gave us is three windows, two doors and two wood burners. And what did they promise? They promised to renovate the whole house. With European money. The village of Kishvasar was supposed to use half a million euros of EU funds to desegregate the Roma community. But while some homes have improved, Norbert and his family of 10 still live in insalubrious conditions. Hardhazi says it's a recurring problem in Hungary. This corrupt system is contagious. This money keeps Orban in power. He pays his people with it. Hungary must stay in the European Union, because as long as we are, then democracy will be protected a bit more. Orban's path from democracy to dictatorship can only happen if we leave the EU. The local mayor disputes this, saying the accounts have been audited by national authorities. She blames price rises for the shortfall. In April, the EU Commission used new powers to sanction Hungary over alleged corrupt use of EU funds. This is only one part of the row between Budapest and Brussels. For five years, the Hungarian opposition has pushed the EU to act on breaches of European values, and the threatened sanctions are a major escalation. This is a huge step for Brussels. This is an actual practical implement, so it's not just some talk about values and you know, legalistic uh, argument, you know, it hits them where it hurts. It's about money. It's about, uh, uh, it has actual sanctions. Uh, the European Union can't be an ATM, it can't be a cash machine. If you want to enjoy the benefits, you have to uh, also honour the obligations. The European Parliament has criticised the Hungarian government over its influence over the judiciary, the electoral and education systems and the media. Independent voices are ever less present. Radio Tilos was created just as the communist regime collapsed. Now 30 years on, it faces losing its license after the Fidesz-controlled regulator said it breached guidelines. After the changes at the end of the 80s, there was a period where we believed that the way people lived in Western Europe was a model that we in Hungary could emulate. But now we can see that we are in fact moving backwards. Hungary's treatment of minorities is also under fire. In 2021, the government changed the constitution to outlaw adoption for same-sex couples. Elvira and Tamara were both born male. Their public battle to be recognised as a same-sex female couple has pushed them into the spotlight of a culture war. Unfortunately, a part of society believes whatever the government says and doesn't see the reality. And that's sad. It's typical of these right-wing politicians that divide people into groups and then say, shun these people and exclude those ones. Viktor Orban's government hasn't had everything its own way. Its attempts to ban so-called LGBT propaganda in schools failed to pass in a national referendum in April. That report from Luke Brown. We're still with Balazs Hidvegi of Fidesz Party. Um, I put it to you, Mr Hidvegi. If France, for example, was found to no longer be able to oversee how EU taxpayers' money was spent, see that it was spent properly, legally, um, that includes, of course, Hungarian taxpayers' money, um, would Hungary accept that? They're using that as a pretext. The, the, the real story is not there. The real story is an ideological warfare against conservative 
Christian Democratic government. The Interestingly, documents that the European Commission yeah, is basing yeah, yeah, yeah. its no, it just it's very important. This procedure is it's a procedure that is uh, subject to European law. Well, so if you say that there's a pretext behind it, there yes, are words on paper that okay. are about the, the spending right, of the money in right. the oversight. Interestingly, European law, as you put it, or especially the European Commission, as they interpret it, has always been uh, critical, interestingly, of uh, conservative governments. It's never been critical of uh, progressive uh, uh, left-wing or liberal uh, politicians or the governments. It's always been, it's every always single been against conservative Christian democratic governments. The real story here... Do you accept that there have been European Commission proceedings against every other EU member state? Not to the extent that, uh, that there have been against Hungary but and Poland. But there have been proceedings against not, other member not, states. Not even comparable. They have waged an ideological war against governments that say no to the left-wing progressive mainstream uh, pushed by Brussels over the past few years. None of those societal issues are part of the proceedings that we're talking about. Not, they, don't, they didn't write it in the, in, the, in the paper, but the real, the real reason is there. It's very simple to see. Balaj Hidfegi, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure, thank you. I am Kathleen Chen. I am a member of the European Parliament from Hungary, representing the Momentum Movement, and I am the Vice Chair of the Liberal Renew Europe Group. I have a very hard time imagining that an election like this can take place in the European Union in 2022. Our candidate was allowed five minutes of live airtime in the whole campaign in the very same day where a big speech of Mr. Orban was repeated nine times. It's a very unequal and very unfair election. But we continue to keep fighting to make our country at least a little bit more prosperous. We spoke to MEP Balaj Hidvegi from Mr. Orban's Fidesz party. He told us that it, it was a fair election. I'm sure he liked the results. Uh, I'm wondering why his party did not uh, take part in even at least one single debate. Hungary is a very good demonstration for total state capture where the state is just everywhere, and where your license or your uh, advertising revenue or the survival of your business depends on whether you have friends at the right place or not. Mr. Hidvegi, uh, who we spoke to, says that the European Commission is waging essentially ideological war against Fidesz because uh, the European Commission doesn't like its conservative stances uh, on issues to do with, for example, LGBT rights. He refutes the idea that it's about lack of oversight in EU spending. Well, I uh, suggested Mr. Hidvegi to read the text of the legislation. It's not about migration, uh, it's not about the media, it's uh, not about LGBTQ rights or anything else uh, they wish to read into it. The problem is that Mr. Orban gave out subsidies uh, from EU money to his family members, friends and uh, loyal cronies. And if he cuts these lifelines, I am afraid uh, he just uh, fears losing power. So that's why millions of Hungarians suffer as a result of his corruption, because right now Hungary does not have access to the billions of euros that uh, we could spend on economic recovery. And as we've heard, the Hungarian government refutes uh, claims that it has acted in a corrupt manner. Looking at the situation regarding the war in Ukraine, uh, the Hungarian government not sending military aid to Ukraine, not letting it cross its territory either. The government saying that this is about peace. It doesn't want Hungary drawn into a war. Of course, nobody wants Hungary to get drawn into the war. It's terrible what's happening in Ukraine. Because Ukraine is not only fighting for itself, but it's fighting for Europe as a whole. Uh, so we have to stand behind them. I am very disturbed by the close relations Mr. Orban has forged with Mr. Putin. Clearly, he is trying to obstruct joint European action also in this very critical time. On a planned EU oil embargo against Russia, Hungary's government has been holding out on this. And they tell us that they're resisting because they believe it would ruin Hungary's economy. We could also set up compensation schemes and mechanisms in Europe. There are so many ways to solve this problem, to be more autonomous in our energy supplies. Now, there has been a very different response to the war in Ukraine in many aspects from the Polish government, from the Hungarian government. Interestingly for us, because they've for such a long time been allies. Uh, do you expect this relationship is changing durably? It's very clear uh, that Mr. Orban has lost even his last ally in Europe. Uh, we have to keep up a united front in Europe. We have to stand up against war crimes, stand up against the aggressor and stay on the right side of history. Katarzyna thank you very much. 
Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Europe Now. Thank you so much for watching. Hope to see you again soon.